Well, here we all are again around the crackling campfire. So glad you could join us. We've flown in from various parts of the world just so we could sit down here around the fire and tell you some stories. Now, I usually do this on my own, but I thought it was about time I invited some of my narrator friends to join me. So, delighted to say that tonight we're going to be hearing stories from Mortis Media, Let's Read and Being Scared, and you know what, I'll tell a few as well. Now, is everyone warm enough? Come on, come in a bit closer to the fire, that's it. Got some cold beers for those of you that are old enough to drink, help yourself, and plenty of hot chocolate to go around to. So, you know what time it is, don't you? Time to sit back with that drink and listen. The Boogeyman of the Algonquin Highlands in Ontario, Canada. The Honey Green Ghost is the tale of a skinned man who endlessly circles campfires, seeking warmth and food. The legend of Honey Green's ghost deals with a handsome young man named Honey Green, lost in the woods who finds a husband and wife eating dinner by campfire. Cold and hungry, Mr. Honeygreen asks if he can stay until the fire burns out. The couple agree and allow him to share their warmth. Unfortunately for the husband and wife, Honeygreen is a dangerous criminal who butchers them when they fall asleep by the fire. It is said the spirits of the Highlands cursed Honeygreen for his actions that night. For days, Honeygreen was unable to find his way out of the woods, or find anything to eat, or a fire to keep him warm. It is said Honeygreen grew so hungry and thin, he began eating his own flesh in starvation. And then, it is said, Honey Green became something else. People claim to still see him walking in the woods at night. Only now, he is tall and thin, with freakish long limbs. And his head is nothing but a broken, decomposing skull with empty eyes. It's said that Honeygreen has hideously oversized, drooling jaws, and that his teeth endlessly chatter, as if his loss of flesh has left him at the bitter mercy of an eternal chill. The legend of Honeygreen's ghost says that if you leave your campfires going too long at night, Honeygreen will approach and beg for company and warmth, often wrapped in clothes to hide his hideous appearance. As soon as the fire is put out, he will leave to search for another. However, it is said that should you fall asleep while your fire still burns, Honey Green will butcher you and wear your flesh. It is also said that the more flesh he wears, the colder he becomes, and the more he desires the warmth of others. One famous image captured by a hunter named Duke Blackcrow claims to show Honey Green being warded away from a campsite with a crucifix. The most famous encounter with Honey Green involved a young teen photographer named Corey Anugan. Corey had heard the story, but didn't take it seriously. He thought it was a cautionary tale to scare campers into <laughs> properly putting out their fires before going to bed at night. Corey was camping by Halls Lake in Ontario, Canada. He was having a party with his friends and, after a night of drinking, he fell asleep in front of the fire.
before he woke up in the early morning hours. The sun hadn't come up yet. Noticing the fire was still barely burning, Corey decided to put it out. And then he saw something out of the corner of his eye. Corey noticed a silhouette standing by the lake, staring directly at the group. The figure was described as tall and lithe, wearing a long black jacket and a large hat. Corey remembered he could hear the waves coming in and going out, making their familiar splashing sound against the sand. Normally, it was a calming sound, relaxing, but this time, it was terrifying. It was a seemingly insignificant detail that gave the moment a frightening sense of legitimacy. Corey went on to wake his sleeping friends, but at that moment the tall silhouette bent over and reached down with its long arm and began to walk away on all fours, like a horse or a dog. The figure looped his head up to look at Corey one final time. Corey took out his camera and took a photo in the dark. The flash of the camera illuminated a horrendous sight. A dirty, decomposing skull resting on a long, grotesquely thin neck. The sight froze Corey to the spot. The phantom rose up to its main height again and stared at Corey. Corey reflexively took another picture. He could see into the ghost's empty, dead eyes. It approached him and took off its hat and bowed. By the dying embers of the firelight, Corey could see its decomposing face. Pardon, it whispered. And then, with a low, grumbling laugh, the ghost returned to all fours and slowly moved away. Down the beach, and towards the forest. Corey put the fire out. There have been 36 hightings of honey green since Corey witnessed it. The KS bar file for the honey green ghost remains open and unsolved. So I think it was only fair, you know, at being the one that invited you all here, that I kick things off. But, of course, I've got a few guests with me tonight, and it's time for me to start introducing them to you. First up, we have the one and only Mortis Media. Now, it's nice for me to have another Brit <laughs> for a bit of company this evening. So, man, how are you doing? Hey! So good to see you guys. And we're glad you're here, too. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing all right. Yeah, just busy with work, you know the usual. <laughs> Believe me, I know exactly how that feels. Hey man, are you warm enough? Yeah, come in a bit closer, come on. I think I'm going to get a bit closer to the fire if that's okay. I'm feeling pretty cold. Of course it is, man. Come on, come in a bit closer. There's plenty of us here. We'll all keep warm together tonight. Okay, feeling better? How about the rest of you? Everyone okay? Come on, you come in a bit closer too. Come on, we're all friends here. So, I think it's time for Modest Media to tell us a story. You ready, man? Okay, here we go. In the year 2010, or 2011, I was beginning to explore YouTube. I watched cat videos and music videos most of the time. But one day, I found an incredible singer. She was doing cover songs and had an amazing voice, and I really liked her cool punk style. I liked her, but didn't have a YouTube account. So I couldn't subscribe to her, and that's why I lost her again. 
after a couple of days. Jump to the year 2015, where I found my all-time favourite YouTuber, Ryan Higger. I love this guy and his content so much. I can't even begin to tell you. I got addicted to him, and I followed him on every social media platform possible. So this brings us to the year 2016. I was graduating in that summer, and I was studying non-stop. One day in June, I think it was Friday the 10th, I was studying for a really long time. It was around half 12 or 1 when I finally said, OK, that's it, I want to stop now. But I was awake too much, so I had to distract myself in order to get tired enough to go back to sleep. So I watched some YouTube videos and looked at the clock again. It was around 4am. Then I thought I was tired enough now to go to sleep. But suddenly a thought came through my mind. I wonder what that YouTuber is doing who I watched back in the day. Is she still singing? What is she doing? And most importantly of all, what was her name? But I couldn't remember her name. I hadn't thought about her in years. So it wasn't a surprise that I couldn't remember her name. But I didn't want to try and look her up that night because I knew that I wouldn't be able to find her immediately. And I was tired and was pretty much done for the internet for now. The next morning I woke up and started scrolling through my Twitter notifications. I noticed that Ryan Higger had tweeted something. Oh cool, I thought. Let's see what he says so I can give it a like. And when I saw it, I saw a hashtag, prayers for Christina. I didn't know what to think of that. I was confused as I didn't know what was going on. And as I kept scrolling down my feed, there was another one. Please tell me that hashtag RIP Christina Grimmy is just a messed up rumor. My whole body froze. I was staring at my phone in disbelief, shock and terror. I knew the face that I was going to see when I googled that name. I couldn't stop my fingers from moving off my phone because I was too scared. I knew the name. I remembered it again. After a minute of staring onto my phone without really looking at it, I googled the name of the girl. And yes, it was her. It was the YouTuber I thought of the night before. She had been shot right after a concert and died. That alone was sad enough because she was such a talented artist. And I'm 100% sure she would have had an amazing career if that incident hadn't have happened. But the fact that I hadn't thought about her in over six years not hearing a single thing about her here in Austria, and then thinking about her on the night of her death? That's too crazy for me. And it still is. I mean, how can it be possible? A couple of weeks later, I thought about the experience, and wondered, when did she die exactly? I mean, what time? So I looked it up, and searched for the time difference between Orlando, where she died, and Austria, and the time of her death. Once I had that, I counted back the hours of the time difference, and got shocked again. She got shot at almost exactly the same time I'd thought about her. Perhaps this is just a coincidence, but they do say that some people, like mediums, can tap into a special and different kind of energy that lets them in on a wealth of information. I'm not really sure what I believe, but I know for sure this is one of the creepiest things that has ever happened to me. Rest in peace, Christina. Well, Mortis Media, that's one hell of a way to get started. Whew, what a story. Thank you so much for that one. We're going to be hearing a couple more from you later on, I think. Yeah? Okay, good. Now, on to the man who really, really got me going on this whole narration lark. Yep. I think I've been telling stories for about a month, not really getting anywhere, nobody was really taking any notice. And I got in touch with Let's Read and said, hey man, <laughs> please, please, let me do something for you so I can drum up some business for my channel. You know what, I had about 60 subscribers at that point. And he was kind enough to say, yeah, sure, come on board. You know, we'll do something together, everything's good. And although I was happy doing it, that was like the real sort of first push 
that made me want to keep going really. So I am eternally grateful to him and he's probably the reason that I'm still here doing this today. And of course, I'm delighted he could join us. I think we've got three stories coming up from you this evening, is that correct? Yeah, okay. Well, I think it's about time we got down to the first one. Okay, man, over to you. Me and my boyfriend love to camp. About two weeks ago, we decided to go to the coast because we had a Friday off from our classes in university and decided to hike and camp out for the weekend. We had a three-day plan to stay in three different towns and hike to each place. The story's about the first place we stayed in. The first town was barely a town. It was more like a bunch of small houses and farmlands and very few people. It was off-season, so normally there would be some tourists there since the main attraction is a huge abandoned city left over from the times of the ancient Greek civilization. Anyway, since there were five to six camping grounds available, one of which was highly recommended on TripAdvisor and the likes of, we didn't bother calling beforehand. We simply headed there and then straight to that camping area. Upon reaching it, we saw the gate open, not really so unusual, but when we entered it, no one seemed to be there. We knocked and called out for someone, and no one responded, except the outdoor bar was all open with expensive bottles of alcohol lined up and food left on the kitchen table, as we saw from the window, so they couldn't have gone far. My boyfriend found it a bit strange that they would leave everything open like that, but assuming it was a small community with no crime, we didn't think more. We went to some other campgrounds to ask if they were open. The first one we went to said that they were closed because their grounds were very messy these days, but they recommended us another place. We asked them about the first grounds we had went to, and strangely, the man said don't go there. When we asked why, he said, eh, just don't. I don't really recommend you going there. So the other place he told us about was also closed, and luckily in the meantime, I found the signboard for the first place and it had their number on it. We called them, and a man picked up and told us that he and his wife, who ran the place, are out for a couple of hours but will be back by evening. He said that we could set up our camp and that we would meet later. The place was a bit secluded, but it was quite picturesque, and we set our campsite and left. We spent the whole day exploring and hiking around, and after a tiring day around 10pm after dinner, started heading back. And this is where things got incredibly creepy. When we got back, we found the place still empty. No one had returned and it was quite late. My boyfriend called up the owners again and they said that they had decided not to return tonight, but that we could leave the money under a table mat by the bar. They said the kitchen and bathrooms are open if we needed to use them. The place was dark and the yard that we had set the camp up was huge and without lighting. My boyfriend immediately started to feel a bit uneasy. He was concerned why two business owners would leave their property completely open to two total strangers with a bar full of unopened bottles and a half-open house. As we walked towards our camp, he kept subtly expressing his uneasiness and kept looking around. He's usually pretty calm, so I told him if he's feeling so strongly about this, we can just go to the pension where we had dinner earlier and stay the night there in a hotel room. He opened the flashlight of his phone and kept looking around, getting more and more uneasy. We agreed to pack up our camp and leave. I began to pack it up since it requires a lot of folding and he was already anxious. I told him to just stand and give me a light as I pack up, except constantly he would move the light and check the area and I kept getting irritated because I could sense his worry and at the same time I couldn't pack fast enough because I couldn't see. At one point he even told me in a slightly complaining way to hurry it up and as soon as I folded the camp stuff we packed it in its bag and hurried and packed our crap and scooted. He still seems super anxious and I told him to relax. Just telling this part gives me the chills all over again. The road back to the main area of the town was dark and lonely, and this is when he told me, there's something I wanted to say, but not while we were still on the grounds. What is it? I asked. He hesitated, then said he didn't want to freak me out, but he was sure that he saw someone lurking in the dark behind the wooded cabins and by the bathrooms twice. No one was supposed to be there except us. I got the chills, but I still tried to rationalize saying it's a farm area, there's a lot of animals, maybe a cat moving around, but he was adamant that it was a human figure, walking like a human would and standing. That is why he kept checking and wanted to hurry so much, and that's why he was telling me to hush up and keep my voice down. I almost had tears in my eyes at this point and the hair on my back was standing. 
I kept looking back and almost running at this point to the lighted area of the quiet town and only really relaxed once we reached the pension and booked a room there, got the key, locked the door and checked it twice. I'm generally a skeptical person but I really do believe my boyfriend didn't just see things. I don't know who that was back there or what could have happened, if anything, but I don't care to know. Whoa, 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 that one was awesome. Okay, thanks so much for that, man. Be hearing more for you again later, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> good. Okay, so, also delighted to be joined by the one and only Being Scared. Hey, how's it going, guys? If you're not familiar with this channel, then where have you been? Okay, he's doing really well, doing a lot of thematic stories, I guess. Stories in the rain, stories by the fire. So, I'm really glad you could join us tonight, man. I'm glad to be here with you. So, what have you got for us? I have a few true scary stories to share. Are you ready? You know what? I think we are ready. You are ready? Yeah, they are. Okay, over to you, man. Driving home from my friend's house one night, I had to pee, so I pulled off the road to go. I was doing my business against an old wire fence that's meant to keep cattle from walking into the street. When I look up and see a man standing in the field in front of me, about 50 yards away, he wasn't moving, just standing there. I seriously cannot even express how scary this was. I got back in my car and drove off. It makes absolutely no sense why someone would be out in that field on a deserted road in the pitch black night. Whoa, ho, ho, ho. short and sweet one there from being scared. Thanks, man. Okay, I think you're going to tell us a couple more later on, aren't you? Yep, okay. Well, I guess it's my turn again already. Everyone okay for hot chocolate? You're keeping warm. Come on, don't be shy. Come in a bit closer. There you go, that's better. All right, plenty more beers for those that are old enough. Here, you. there you go, take one, come on. We're all friends here. All right, everyone ready? I apologize for my American accent in advance. <laughs> well, you're just going to have to put up with it for the rest of the evening, okay? Summer camp was a memorable part of my childhood, but most memorable was that summer of 72. It was my last summer as a kid. I'd just turned 15 and was looking forward to starting high school in the fall with the older teenagers. Camp Tonkawa was located in the thick forest of East Texas, about 43 miles from my home. There was nothing really exceptional about the camp. We'd have the standard amenities, a lake, lots of woods to explore, an archery and rifle range, and a nature preserve. The thing that was exceptional were the three leading counselors. Mr. Rivera was a would-be jock and was in charge of organizing sports and running the archery and rifle ranges. Mr. Holloway led arts and crafts and taught camping and outdoorsmanship. But the counselor I remember most was Mr. Blackburn. He was a kind of a brainiac and maintained the nature preserve. He also taught us about the flora and fauna around the camp, but was particularly interested in bugs. He'd been a doctoral candidate for several years before and studied insects in the Amazon basin. No one knew why he didn't finish his doctorate. He was certainly bright enough. It wasn't hard to imagine Mr. Blackburn in a cocky outfit and chasing insects with a butterfly net through the rainforest. <laughs> he was a bespectacled man of about 35, with tousled dark hair and the hint of a beard which grew steadily longer as the week progressed. He was uh, far from fastidious in dress. In fact, in other circumstances, you might call him a slob. His denim jeans had seen better days, and were often uh, besmeared with mud, <laughs> while his shirts bore the scars of battles with briars and brambles in the wild. It was the end of August, 
and the end of camp. Tradition dictated that we rendezvoused at various campfires in the evening of the last day. Each campfire was supervised by one of the counselors, and it so happened that Mr. Blackburn attended ours. I was in a group of about ten or eleven boys, sequestered in a small clearing on the lake shore. We roasted marshmallows and made hot dogs and s'mores as the twilight passed into night. In the bright fire's glow, we passed the evening with talk of the past and dreams of the future. The campfire crackled and cast a protective circle of light. Above us, an endless number of stars stretched across the heavens and around us, an endless void of dreary night. We huddled close to the light, for although none would admit it, the surrounding darkness held terrors we could only imagine. In a pretend show of bravery, someone suggested telling ghost stories as the night grew darker. I'll tell you boys, the Amazon is a femme fatale, at once beautiful and dangerous. Oh, and the heat, oh, the heat is stifling, is a place of contrast. There are ageless trees that rise on every side and dominate the land. There are magnificent waterfalls and birds and animals found nowhere else in the world. The jungle is often breathtaking, like some magnificent painting elegantly and lovingly created with exquisite strokes on the world canvas. But within the beauty, there is also danger. There are things in the jungle no tale of horror could hope to describe. There are man-eating cats that prowl the night, and piranha that devour a man during the day. There are spiders as big as your head, and monstrous snakes that are the stuff of nightmares. But the thing even the natives dread. The creature that kills without pity or remorse is the black caiman. What's that? One of the boys hesitantly interrupted. A creature from the blackest abyss of hell, son. Mr. Blackburn continued. It's the devil's blend of alligator and crocodile that prowls the river and kills the unsuspecting. Its black head is invisible on the water, but its dark, lifeless eyes watch you, waiting, floating nearer and nearer. Then, with a lightning flash of jaws, its teeth rip you open and you hear your own terrible screams as the creature swallows you whole. The sudden cry of an owl caused an involuntary scream from us all. Our eyes strained against the darkness and imagined the creature lurking silently in the lake just beyond. Mr. Blackburn paused a moment to let us reflect on his description. We all became a little more aware of the night. We stopped at one of the local villages to trade for food and water and heard the stories of a monstrous black caiman the natives call Rio Morte. <laughs> it means river death. Few have seen the creature and lived. You know, boys, he added, the river people say the jungle keeps its own. They believe that when the jungle takes a life, it leaves Hanatu. That means the ghost who walks. They're the spirits that have neither grave for rest nor fulfillment of earthly purpose. And so, they wander the earth for all time. They are drawn to the living, for they feel the energy of life that has been denied them. They long for the warmth of another human being but feel only the cold of premature destruction. The river people respect Hanatu. They fear only Rio Morte. Loaded with supplies and information, 
we set out again on our journey down the Amazon. Carlito and I fruitlessly searched the river banks for the elusive butterflies, then continued downriver. It was late afternoon and the sun had already disappeared behind the forest canopy. Dark shadows fell across the river as daylight surrendered to the encroaching night. As we slowly paddled our inflatable launch, we had the vague, uneasy feeling of being watched. The dark Amazon waters meandered through the jungle, and we became acutely aware of the sounds of the approaching night. Suddenly, behind us, there was a splash. We both looked but only saw turbulent water near the riverbank. Then Carlito saw the thing in the dim afternoon twilight. That huge dark head and black eyes protruding from the river. Rio Morte, Carlo cried. Rio Morte. I drew my pistol and fired at the beast, but the bullet glanced off his thick hide and the creature disappeared beneath the water. We searched the Inky River in vain, and suddenly a vicious blow struck our boat from beneath, and Carlito was thrown overboard. He frantically struggled to climb into the boat, and I grabbed his arm and began to pull. With a sudden thrash of water, Carlito was pulled from my grasp. The beast rolled over and over in the water. I heard Carlito scream in terror and agony as the river turned crimson and the creature disappeared once more. I paddled feverishly toward the riverbank, but I could see that black head follow faster and faster. With a great splash of water, those huge jaws suddenly ripped into the boat. I was thrown into that murky water and began to swim harder than I ever did before. My heart pounded and I panicked as I clawed at the precipitous river bank, that black monster from hell swam closer and closer. I suddenly felt a crushing pain on my ankle. I was struggling, helpless, as I was pulled under the river and breathed its water into my lungs. The storyteller paused, then said, Maybe this story is too scary. Let's finish the story later. Then, there was a cry of protest from one of the boys. No, tell us now. What happened next? Well, our narrator continued. Then, he ate me, of course. Mr. Blackburn smiled and faded away into the dying campfire glow. Ah, oh, you know what? It really is nice having some company around the fire. You know I love you guys, but it's great to be sharing the stories out with some of my other narration buddies. Well, what did you think of that one? Like it? That is a top-notch story. Well, thank you, Mortis Media. That's very kind of you. Now, you know what? I love this community because we're all in it together. And we like to help each other out. We're not very competitive. But you know what? Tonight, I really want to see if you've got a scarier story than me. So, think you're up to the task? If you think that's spooky, just wait for this one. <laughs> that's the spirit. Okay, then. Over to you again, man. There was a small door that led to the attic space in my bedroom, and it became habit that I would shut the door as I walked into my bedroom a couple of times a week. I didn't think anything of it, just assumed my mum didn't close it all the way when she left. After a while, I made the mistake of joking with her when she made a comment about me not picking up after myself. I said something like, every night, I have to close the attic door behind you. How about you shut it all the way when you're done? She then informed me 
that she hasn't been in the attic for months. I asked my brother, and he said that he hadn't either. I asked my father and it was the same response. So then I started to pay really close attention to it, making sure that it was closed in the mornings, checking it after school, checking it after dinner, and then heading up to bed, and it would be open. After a couple of months of wandering, studying, and experimenting, I thought I'd see what happens if I just didn't shut it. I opened the door before school, and checked it after school, still open. Checked it after dinner, still open. Before bed, still open. Now I'm laying in bed, mine going crazy with the open door across the room, and decide to check it out. So I roll over and focus on the black space in the attic, to see a face staring back at me. I bolt downstairs, wake my parents, and get ridiculed by my brother. I switch bedrooms with my brother, and move into a new house about six months later. I chance, my new physics teacher and his wife bought our old house. I could have forgotten all about the events, and chalked it up to me having an overactive imagination. But then, in my senior year, I discovered how awesome our physics teacher was, and it became my favourite class by far, and he was my favourite teacher. At the end of the senior year, my friend and I took our VHS camcorder around town, doing mostly silly things. We happened to be walking by my old house, and we were just seeing from the outside what they'd done with the place. When we spot our physics teacher, and he offers to give us a tour. I got to tell him the story about all the projects that my dad did whilst we were still in the house, and then his wife led us upstairs to show us the sewing room. I asked jokingly, notice anything strange in this room? And her face goes blank, on camera. She asks what I mean, and I try to shrug it off, but end up saying something about the attic door. She confirmed that every time she goes up to sew, the attic door will be open. She then tells us that on the second day of being in that house, their dog, a German Shepherd, had gone into the room, but would not go back downstairs. He started barking, and could not be consoled, and then jumped through the window landing on the tin roof over the porch and running off. The dog did not come back until the next day, and has not stepped foot into the hallway that leads up to the staircase. I had the initial thought that I could show my parents and brother the story I had on film, but I decided to just let it be. The event itself was easy to shrug off because I could chalk it up to a lot of other possibilities when I was younger. It wasn't until five years later that it became freaky. The look on the wife's face before she told us about the dog was very telling. Like something they decided to never put much thought into. Now my story added depth to their experience, and their story added depth to mine. I wish I had those VHS tapes from 20 something years ago. I moved a lot after high school, and the tapes did not make it through all the moves. Shame, really. I only wish that one day I can find out what it was that was in that house. Well, Mortis Media, what can I say? You are on fire tonight. Another brilliant story from you there. Well, who's up next? Let's read. You ready? Got another one for us? Okay, great. All right. Over to you, then. I'm an American living abroad in a place with lots of nature and mountains not far from my house. It's been a great past month of summer weather and I've taken advantage of it by hiking nearly every day. Now the country I'm in is incredibly low key, especially in the residential towns, so the illusion of safety remains. The mountains are just less than a mile from our house. On this day I was chatting with a friend in the US and decided to go up to the mountain's base and loop back down. It's about three miles, but not as strenuous as hiking up the thing. So I'm chatting with her, slightly animated and making my way up this slope paved road to get to the base 
and have a first unsettling encounter with a truck driver who tries to solicit me. I just give him this look like, WTF, I'm alone, you're a fool and making me feel unsafe. Bye, Felicia. This doesn't turn into anything, but I'm more on guard. I am by myself, after all. My husband is at work. I get to the base and I'm telling my friend about this creepy truck driver and suddenly I have this urge to get out of plain sight. I'm at the mountain's base, which is to the left, and in front and to the right of me for probably an eighth of a mile is the parking lot. This mountain also has skiing in the winter, quite a popular place. I get across the parking lot to the right and enter the forest across from the mountain. I'm super thirsty and the stream water at the edge of this forest is drinkable, so I start taking sips from my palms. Now this area of the forest is right by the parking lot, thank god, with a walking trail to get back down from the mountain's base but it's still enclosed by lots of trees and shrubs, obscured from the view of the public. There are some people at the mountain, which was good. Anyway, I'm taking a break from drinking some water, still talking to my friend, when a different man enters the forest where I am. And he's majorly staring. Seriously, he gave himself away from the moment he entered the forest. His body language, gaze, everything was off, wrong. Not today, honey. I look him up and down. He looks strong, in shape, white tee, blue shorts, brown hair, and eyes with light skin. Staring. But he doesn't approach me. Instead he walks adjacent to me, crossing the path over the stream and goes to the other side of the stream directly across from me. I don't hear what my friend is saying. I'm watching him. I notice then that this guy has a knife. Like clear as day. Just has a knife in his hand. And he leans up against a tree, gripping this knife in his fist, and stares at me waiting to see what I'll do. I quickly decide that going deeper in the trail is a no-go. It seems he's anticipating that I'm distracted talking to my friend and that I'll continue on my way. This isn't an option because the trail doesn't lead to a road that cars can drive on for a good while. There's much fewer people on this trail too. I've seen enough horror movies. I suddenly realized that my uneasiness need to get out of sight when I got the mountain might have been because I was also being pursued by this knife man, not just some sleep deprived truck driver looking for a good time. I turn on my heel and sprint out of the forest. Luckily I can see a car driving towards me where I am. It's a mother teaching her daughter how to drive. It had randomly started to downpour rain, appropriate, and I look like a lunatic myself running towards them, but it's okay. I'm a 5'7 blonde girl, not a creep with a huge knife. I explain to them what has happened and they let me into the car immediately, lock the door and call the police. After about 30 seconds, the man exits the enclosure and starts walking back in the direction of where I came from, the mountain's base. He's walking briskly and doesn't have a car of his own. The car I got into had tinted windows so I don't think he knew I was in there. I tell the mother that that's the guy, but we don't want to provoke him. He disappears quickly before the police arrive. I give the police a description, but now I don't think they ever found him. Part of me now wants to believe nothing would have happened, but he didn't go out of his way to make me feel comfortable. Everything about him was bad, and he was literally flashing his knife at me, sizing me up. It seems to me anyway that he knew I was foreign. I was on the phone and might not have noticed him. I look like an easy target. But thanks to what I've heard here, I'm more vigilant than ever, and squash the situation before it escalated. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why he has over 300,000 subscribers on YouTube. Fantastic story, man. Got another one coming up from you later? Yeah, good, okay. Alright, being scared. I think you're next up. You ready for us? Good, okay. Over to you. One of my childhood homes had a balcony that was attached to both my mother's bedroom and mine via big glass doors in each of our rooms. Next to the balcony are two trees. One of them I often used to climb up and down from the balcony. One night, my brother and my mother weren't home. I was 13 years old, reading in bed with a very dim reading light. I heard what sounded like something moving in one of the trees outside. But this didn't worry me, as possums and bats are common in our area. Now, I had thin curtains on the glass doors that separated my room and the balcony, 
and the doors faced out towards the street where street lamp light was always visible through my curtains. Shortly after hearing the tree rustling noises, I see a shadow slowly move past the doors, at which point I immediately turn off my reading light and freeze like a deer in headlights. The shadow is tall, so it wasn't a neighbor kid, and it definitely wasn't my mother, who was five foot tall. The person moved slowly, creeping as though they were trying not to be noticed. They wouldn't likely be able to see into my room, but I could see them thanks to the streetlights behind them. They moved past my doors out of sight. I sat there unable to move or even think about what to do other than be absolutely still. That is, until I heard another sound. The sound of someone trying to open a glass door. My mom's doors to the balcony. I didn't know if she had locked them or not, but I wasn't taking chances. I moved as quickly and as silently as I could to my bedroom door and locked it. I listened for what the person was doing now, and they were still jiggling the glass door handle, but it sounded like the doors weren't opening. I felt relief. This person couldn't get in, surely. All I had to do was wait for them to realize that, and then they would leave, right? I heard light footsteps move back along the balcony to my set of glass doors until I saw his shadow stop directly in front of them. Again, I froze. He couldn't see me. He couldn't know that I can see him. I saw a shadow of a hand reach up to my door's handle and my heart stopped. Had I locked those doors today? I was out there earlier. What if I forgot? The seconds leading up to him grabbing the handle felt like an eternity, but thankfully, when this person tried to open the door, it did not open. It was locked. I sighed such a sigh of relief, I was worried that he had heard it. After this, he began pacing the length of the balcony. I didn't have a cell phone, and the landline was at the other end of the house, but I was too scared to take my eyes off the person. I was silently crying and praying that they would just leave. Then I heard him stop moving and then he said, I could just break the glass, you know. Before I could even process this, I saw car headlights turn around the corner of my street and then stop at our property gate. My mom was home. The person on the balcony moved out of sight when my mom came inside, I was hysterical and was barely coherent in telling her what happened. Eventually, I got the message across and she called the police. They never found or caught anyone, but a neighbor reported a truck in the street that matched the description of a truck that had been reported recently for attempted child abductions near my school, which was a block away. Wow. Hope you're enjoying this, folks. Coming up to the hour mark. Everyone keeping warm? Good. Okay, let's throw a few more logs on the fire. Let's keep this thing going. Make sure everyone stays nice and warm. More hot chocolate, anyone? Okay, here you go. Right. Well, guess it's my turn again, isn't it? Ready? Okay, here we go. There are what? At the front entrance of Camp Slenderwood. The beginning of my seven day long <laughs> prison sentence had begun. I never was into the outdoors. I much preferred staying inside, browsing the internet. The only reason I was there in the first place was because my parents wanted some privacy to uh, do their taxes. I was almost 18 and I knew what that really meant. I figured it would be better just to go with their plan than to uh, interrupt their alone time. Still, I had to admit to myself that the camp didn't look particularly unpleasant. The weather was nice, 
The trees were fresh and filled with green, and there was a crystal clear lake nearby the cabins. I figured it would at least be tolerable to stay here, even without a Wi-Fi connection. I decided I would give it a fair chance and keep an open mind about the new experience. In the middle of the camp, between the lunch benches, was a stage with a mustached man wearing a Camp Slanderwood t-shirt. Dozens of campers had already begun to surround the stage while the man yelled through the microphone. Welcome, Welcome to Camp, camp Slanderwood, kids, kids, he shouted. My name is Elwood Dulcy, but you can all call me Elwood. I'm the owner of this place, and I live here all season to help run the camp and answer any questions. We had an amazing turnout this week. There are 64 teens here ready to learn what it means to survive. I wondered to myself what he meant by uh, survive. There was nothing in the brochure about this being a survivalist camp. We were supposed to be provided sleeping quarters and three meals throughout the day. Was I going to be expected to hunt a boar or something? I figured he must have been exaggerating and let the thought go after a few moments. We've already assigned everyone their cabins, Elwood continued. Just grab your cam ID cards from Lexi over there and she'll point you in the right direction. He pointed to a pretty blonde in her twenties, who was also wearing a Camp Slenderwood t-shirt. She looked cheerful, almost overly cheerful, and was waving ID cards in her hands enthusiastically. Kids began rushing over to Lexi to grab their ID cards and get their assigned cabins. I followed as well, tuning out the rest of Elwood's speech. With any luck? I'd find someone to spend these seven days with that felt just as out of place as I did. Fortunately, not long after that I bumped into a quiet looking guy trying unsuccessfully to load up my favorite forum on his phone. His name was Brian, and we hit it off instantly, spending most of the first day talking about how dorky all of the camp supervisors looked. They were all over the top friendly. <laughs> And seemed to care just a little too much about what kind of day everyone was having. Two counselors had already asked me if something was wrong when I'd not finished all of my Salisbury steak. One of them even offered me cold medicine when I cleared my throat. The only worker who seemed normal was Mr. Todd, the cafeteria supervisor and cook. He wasn't quite as talkative, but at least he didn't constantly patronize us. Brian and I wound up getting separated after dinner. I got to know a few more of the campers at that point, as well as see the camp supervisors put on a show and dance with no background music. When I got to my cabin that night, I was disappointed to see Brian was not in the same one. There were three campers inside who apparently were my roommates. They seemed like alright guys, but none of us talked much before going to sleep. I was actually excited about what was in store for the next day. Morning came very quickly, and it wasn't long before I found Brian sitting near the cafeteria. The benches were less full than yesterday, but it was still early. At first I thought most of the campers were still in bed but by late afternoon it still felt like half of them were missing. I went up to Mr. Todd and asked him if all of the kids had come for breakfast and lunch. Mr. Todd shook his head and plopped a burger on my plate. I couldn't shake the feeling that something odd was going on. Everything felt much more active yesterday. There were only a few people circling the Camp Slendwood puppet show and even fewer were spread out in the woods area. I became more suspicious when I realized that a good amount of campers were still missing by dinner time. Huh. What was going on here? 
I wish I'd gotten to know everyone better the first day, so I could figure out who was still here and who wasn't. When I got back to my cabin, all three of my roommates were already inside. It comforted me a little to see them. Perhaps I just made a mistake. I decided to check with them to see if they'd noticed anything strange. To my surprise, they all shrugged my question off and acted like they didn't know what I was talking about. Was I just making myself go crazy? How could over 30 kids just up and vanish without trace or without anyone saying something? The thought was ridiculous. And I laughed about it to myself as I fell into a deep sleep. The third day, things got even weirder. I guess my nerves were pretty worked up because I woke a little before daylight. The camp looked much more foreboding under the darkness. The slender trees wrapping around the sky until all you could see was shrouds. Even creepier was the fact that I could see all the camp supervisors standing in a circle outside. I couldn't tell what was going on, but several of them were hunched over awkwardly. The sight was very unsettling, and I quickly hid away from my window so they wouldn't see me. It was at that point I realized that two of my roommates were not in the cabin. I'd seen them go to bed that night, but now their beds were fully made and their belongings were nowhere to be found. Out of panic, I woke up my remaining roommate to get some answers. When I told him our roommates were gone, he got agitated with me and said we had no roommates before going back to sleep. When day came, I left the cabin to investigate. Now there are only one or two kids near the cafeteria, but none of them seemed alarmed in any way. I kept repeating what my remaining roommate had said to me that night. Was he pulling some kind of sick joke on me? The camp supervisors were acting completely normal, but I didn't dare ask him anything. I started asking every kid I could find where the other campers were, and each time they said there were only 16 of us. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. There were definitely more than 16 campers the first day. Elwood had said there were 64. Were they abducting some of us at night? If so, why was I the only one who could remember anything. Something wasn't right here, and I had to figure out what it was. I was beyond relieved to find Brian out by the lake. At least there was one person here who would listen to me. When I got to him, I frantically started explaining everything that I'd seen. The more I told him, the more concerned his expression got. By the time I finished, he was actually sweating, and he had completely lost eye contact with me. I don't know what you're talking about, he said blankly. There were only 16 of us that registered to stay. <sighs> Maybe you just got confused when all the families were here. Brian was staring at the ground so hard, you'd think there was a snake there. My heart sank as I realized that I couldn't trust him anymore. I had never felt so utterly and completely alone. Without saying another word, I got up and left. I was walking in a fog, not even aware of where I was headed. Fear and dread was beginning to take over me. I had to find some place to hide. Eventually, I wandered back to my cabin, where I stayed under my covers for the remainder of the day. I didn't know what else to do, so I laid there helpless until I miraculously drifted to sleep. I wasn't surprised at all when I woke up to see my cabin completely empty. 
Sure enough, the few campers I managed to track down believed there were only eight of us. This was way too much for me to handle. My survival instincts were beginning to kick in. I made sure no one was looking, and I darted off as fast as I could towards the exit of the camp. I was surrounded by at least 70 miles of wilderness, but it was better than just waiting to disappear. <sighs> but they must have been watching me, because I was intercepted within less than a minute by Elwood and three supervisors. Elwood had a huge grin on his face and was staring at me with eyes wide open. Whoa there, little buddy. <laughs> Where are you running off to? I'd sure have hell to pay from your parents if I lost one of my only eight campers. <laughs> An impulse told me to fight. But I knew I was outmatched and outnumbered. They started closing in on me causing me to back up slowly. Suddenly, Elwood stopped. I know what you need. He smiled ominously at me. You need to play charades with us. Come on, it's just about to start. Feeling trapped and violated, I reluctantly agreed and followed him to the bench area. I played charades all day feeling sick as I pushed down my desire to yell for help. I didn't sleep at all that night. I didn't look out of the window either. I didn't think I could handle seeing any more late night gatherings by my prison guards. When the morning of the fifth day came, I felt hung over from stress. My eyes had sunken in and my skin felt dry. There were now only four campers left, which didn't even make sense anymore. As I got my breakfast, I looked up at Mr. Todd and remembered how he had been the only one I felt was normal. Now that I was thinking about it, I didn't see him in the circle of supervisors outside either. He was my only chance. So a very quietly whispered to him. Mr. Todd, please help me. They're gonna take me if you don't do something. Mr. Todd didn't look at me, but I could see him trying hard to keep his composure. His eyes looked like they were slightly watering, and he was shaking. It reminded me of the way Brian reacted when I reached out to him. If you need to talk, Come see me by the lake this afternoon. He responded, after what felt like an eternity. I could tell by the way he said it that he wanted to end the conversation for now. So I quickly headed out to eat. I waited by the lake for the entire day, but Mr. Todd never showed up. I waited until dark, when a supervisor came and escorted me back to my cabin. I felt defeated, and due to not having slept in two days, I felt exhausted. I fell asleep within minutes and enjoyed the temporary peace. It was the sixth day now. The week was almost over. I wondered to myself if I would survive it, which made me appreciate the speech Elwood gave the first day. He hadn't been exaggerating when he said I would learn what it means to survive. I knew that if someone made it through this, it would be a miracle. To my disappointment, Mr. Todd was not in the cafeteria serving breakfast that day. The new cook was Mr. Beardsley, and he had never heard of Mr. Todd. It was now down to two campers, but what really shocked me was that the only other camper left besides me was Brian. I hadn't spoken to Brian since he'd lied to me. I felt uneasy about him, but I was beginning to accept that there may be nothing more I could do. Perhaps as a way to make peace with my situation, I sat down with Brian 
and began to talk. You may be hiding something from me, but you're the closest thing I have to a friend. I don't want to try to force the truth out of you. I just want one last day to enjoy. Can you give me that? Brian looked at me, his eyes lighting up a bit. I knew you'd come around. There's no need to be depressed during your whole vacation. The two of us talked about sci-fi shows and website design for the rest of the day. And I actually felt some comfort in taking my mind off my grim reality. I awake on the seventh day with a heavy heart. I knew Brian would be gone. And it would just be me and the supervisors. My parents were due to pick me up early tomorrow, so I didn't completely let go of the hope of getting home. I felt genuinely spooked walking around camp. The workers were all fixated on me, and staring at me obsessively. They kept calling me their favorite little camper, and tried to put on show after show in front of me. The new cook still made all the meals in bulk just left the food I didn't take sitting out to rot. I tried jogging as a distraction, but Elwood would just follow right behind me and compliment me on my form. I was thankful when the sun finally went down and I was left alone in my cabin. There was no way I was falling asleep tonight. I couldn't risk getting abducted like all the others. I started drinking from a mug of coffee that I'd gotten from the cafeteria. I expected to feel energized quickly, but it felt like it was making me more tired, if anything. I drank more to try to wake up, but it only made my eyelids feel heavier. Something was in the coffee. Something was... Welcome to Camp Slannerwood, Elwood shouted through his microphone. We have a great turnout this week. Sixty-four teens have come to learn what it means to survive. I didn't see anything in the brochure like that, a freckle-faced kid whispered to another camper in the crowd. You don't think that has anything to do with that missing kid from last year, do you? No. Nah. This place is totally safe, the second camper answered back. By the way, I'm Brian. Well, is that me done for the evening? No, 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 I think I'll do one more right at the end. But, glad to say everybody else has got one more storyline up for us. Okay, being scared? Ready? I think this is the last one you've got for us this evening, isn't it? Alright, over to you. Some years ago, I was staying at my parents' place looking after their cat while they were away on vacation. At a little before 5 a.m. one morning, I was woken to the sound of the glass on their front screen door, shattering, followed by pounding on the door. I went to the door to find out what was happening. Long story short, one of the neighbors had a grown child living with them who had a psychotic breakdown. He attempted to murder both his parents with a big butcher knife. His mom escaped and ran to my parents' house. I let her in, of course. Her arms and hands were covered in defensive wounds, and she had also been stabbed several times. She ended up surviving. Her husband did not. The kid committed suicide. The scariest part that I didn't know until later. At the time that I let the mother in, as I was closing the door, I thought I saw someone else. I opened it thinking maybe it was the father needing help too, but no one was there so I shut the door again and went back to helping the mom. A neighbor who had been woken up by the noise and looked out the window told me that it was the son chasing his mom up my parents' front steps that I had seen. He turned away after I closed the door and went back and killed his father instead. 
If I had been five seconds later letting her in, she likely would have been killed on my parents' front doorstep. A couple seconds faster opening the door again, and he still would have been there. Well, I think you can tell why being scared is doing so well. Head over to his channel, okay? Make sure you do that right away if you're not subscribed already. He has got a fantastic selection of videos for you. More crackling campfire stories. Some told in thunderstorms, in the rain. Really great selection. Can't recommend his channel highly enough to you. Okay, who have we got up now? Mortis, you ready? No? Okay. How about you, Les Reed? Think we can take one more from you this evening? Of course we can. Okay then, man. Let's hear it. About four years ago, I was a junior at a small college in L.A. County. Bordering my town was a large, cavernous region known as Turnbull Canyon. It's the kind of place that has a healthy amount of creepy folklore surrounding it, with an area emphatically known as Hell's Gates. Stories of cultic activity, gang killings, abandoned mental institutions, and the like. The kind of stuff that you hear about for any place that's old enough to have a reputation. In reality, most of the stories were spurned from a tragedy that occurred years prior. A woman's body was found at the base of the canyon, and from then on the rest is history. Nevertheless, when a photographer friend asked me and another buddy to go out to the canyon in order to take some photos of the LA skyline, I had to oblige. The canyon was about a 30 minute drive from our campus, and we had been listening to the King of Limbs the entire drive, which proved to be the perfect ambience to get me feeling pretty anxious about our little excursion. I should also note that I'm a pretty anxious guy in general, so traveling out to a remote area preceded by its reputation for scary occurrences admittedly had me thinking twice about the decision. At the top of the canyon, there is a small residential area, a few ritzy houses surrounded by trees and woods. In order to venture into the canyon itself, you have to follow a main trail with several smaller arteries that split off in other directions but ultimately culminate after a couple of miles or so at the base of a steep hill adorned with an old water tower overlooking the city. Anyhow, we parked our car at the top of the canyon road, divvied up the camera gear, and made our way out to the trailhead, around 1 a.m. by this point. After walking the trail for about five minutes, Dave, the photographer, decided it was time to set up his first shot while Jeff, our other friend, and I kept watch. Eventually he got the shot he needed and we continued walking for another five or so minutes before Dave decided to set up his next shot. At this point the trailhead had disappeared behind us completely and we were a little less than a quarter of the way to the water tower. While setting up the tripod, we noticed the faint glow of headlights off in the distance, which was strange because the trail isn't meant for cars, nor is it big enough for them to pass through. If I recall correctly, it's only about five feet wide with shrubbery on both sides. This was clearly a bit of a red flag for us as we were the only people out there, so we immediately packed up our things and ducked off into the brush waiting for the car to pass on. Eventually, an old pickup truck idled to a stop about 50 yards from where we were hiding. The truck itself was old and rickety, sitting on a lifted chassis, the bed of which was missing entirely. Growing up in the country, I knew it was the type of truck typically owned by backwoods folks who lived in the boonies and preferred to be left to their own devices. We watched in agonizing anticipation as the truck just idled in place for several minutes before flooring it down one of the other trails, the roar of the engine echoing throughout the canyon. Clearly we were spooked at this point, the three of us speculating as to our next step. Jeff and I were reluctant to continue while Dave assured us that it was probably nothing, perhaps just a guy off-roading as he put it. So, with this great reluctance, Jeff and I trudged on behind Dave toward the water tower to get his final shots. Nevertheless, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off about the truck. I mean, I knew plenty of people in high school who would go off-roading for fun in the woods, but never on finicky canyon trails barely wide enough to hike on, let alone drive. It just didn't sit right with me. After walking without interference for about an hour, we finally made it to the water tower, climbed the hill to the top, and took in the view of the city. Dave once again started setting up his equipment while Jeff and I stood on both sides of the water tower, keeping watch just in case the truck came back. Nothing. At this point it's around 3am, 
Dave decides that he's got all the shots he needs, so we pack up our equipment and commit to heading back before it gets too late, seeing as how all of us have classes in just a few hours. Just as we're preparing to descend the hill, the truck comes roaring out of the canyon below us, back onto the trail, at which point the driver attempts to climb the hill, revving the engine loudly. Scared out of our mind, the three of us slid off the side of the hill into the brush, clinging to plants and rocks. As the truck finally made it atop the hill, slowly driving around the tower, we could see the glow of the headlights each time it circled above us. After waiting for nearly 10 minutes, while also trying not to make any noise, the truck eventually descended the hill, stopping in the middle of the trail not more than 100 yards away. We watched as a scruffy man, mid-50s, stepped out of the idling truck and into the glow of its headlights, moseying around while looking at the ground. He then knelt down, looking at something in the dirt, surveying the area intently. As he did so, it became increasingly apparent that he was tracking something. Our footprints. This next part still chills me to the bone. As my friends and I huddled together watching in complete terror, another man wearing a long, dark parka emerged from the brush right where we had been hiking, joining the other man at his side. Apparently he had been out there the entire time we were walking the trail just watching us, following behind at a safe distance. The two of them talked for a long while, but we couldn't hear a word. They continued scanning the area, looking at our footprints, but eventually got in the truck and drove off down one of the forks in the trail. We sat in silence for a long time, waiting nearly two hours just to ensure the coast was clear, at which point we bolted back to the car, down the canyon, and back to our campus. Just in time for class. there we are the master thank you so much man it's been a real pleasure having you around the fire this evening hope we can do this again sometime soon eh well we're not quite done yet modis media you're ready for us now aren't you yeah <laughs> okay good so let's have the last one from you this evening this incident happened in a flat when i was six or seven years old i remember this very clearly still to this day, and it makes my spine shiver thinking about it. I had the largest bedroom in the flat. My mum had decorated the walls with pink and lavender paint and cute little metallic swirls. I had bunk beds, glittery curtains in my window, charms, and glittery things hanging from the ceiling. Any young girl's dream. I remember getting into bed that night and everything seemed normal at first. My room wasn't usually too dark because the moonlight shone through my window, through my glittery curtains, and trying to sleep for what seemed like a while. I don't know why, but I started to look around my room, particularly in the alcove area, in the dark corner. I couldn't focus my eyes properly for a while, but when I did, I noticed my girl's world's head, one of those plastic weird lady heads you do makeup and style her hair on, really stood out in the moonlight against the creepy dark corner. I remember going to lay back down, in my bed, but I had the urge to look back, and when I did, I was paralysed with fear. At first I thought I might be imagining it, because I had been staring at a plastic lady head, but I swear. I saw this dark, woman-like outline standing right there, next to the head. It was a dark grey, black mist, but in the shape of a woman. I slowly looked at her, or it, with its massive bulging eyes, scanning down, and saw that she had no feet. There was nothing there. No shadow. No feet. Nothing. She, or it, was levitating about ten inches off the ground, and it seemed like she was moving towards me. I was absolutely terrified, and will always remember this, because of how cripplingly scary it was. I was in shock, and I quickly spun around in bed and curled into the fetal position, with my quilt tightly wrapped around me. I made sure the quilt was tightly containing my neck and head, 
and can I add that there were no labels or anything that could have emulated what happened next. I was shaking and trying not to breathe loudly when I felt something stand behind me, leaning over me. I closed my eyes and gripped the quilt tight when all of a sudden I felt a tickle on the back of my neck. You know the feeling you get when someone unexpectedly puts their cold fingers on the back of your neck. It started off like that, and became quickly more aggressive, tightening around the back of my neck, as if someone was trying to keep a hold of me. I was trying to scream, but no words came out. I was sweating and shaking, and my neck was getting worse. It was hurting. I tried screaming over and over, but all that came out were little squeaks. It was like gasping for air. I remember the moment when I was finally able to scream for my mother. I screamed at the top of my lungs, but it came out crackled, like a blood-curdling cry for help. She came running in, and as soon as she flung open the door, and that burst of light shone through the room, the whole thing stopped. My mum grabbed me out of bed and carried me to the front room cradling as I sobbed hysterically. To this day, she still believes me, and said that even though she has never personally experienced anything paranormal, there was no way I would lie about what I saw, nor my reaction. From then on, I slept in my mum's bed for a while, and we moved out shortly after. I'm grateful we haven't needed to go back since. Well, Maltese Media... Like I said, man, it's been a real pleasure having you by the fire. Doing really well, aren't you? Nearly 60,000 subscribers now. Yep, another channel I can't recommend to you enough. Head over there at the end of this video, check him out. He has got a fantastic selection of videos waiting for you to watch. Oh, look, look at the time. It's getting late. The fire's starting to get a little bit dim. One more story, though. Are you up for it? Of course you are. Well, I'll tell you what. Let me round things off this evening. I've got one more for you. Already? Okay. December 10th, 2003. My frozen hands tremble as I fumble to work my little butane lighter. The tips of my fingers are raw and bloodied already. And I wince in pain with every failed attempt to spark a flame. Finally, I achieve a jittery fire which impatiently dances atop the lighter. I carefully lower it to my pile of kindling, and the fire cautiously creeps out and spreads until it's a healthy size. I watch it for a while, tending to it until it's strong. Now, there is enough light to see around me, and enough heat to survive the night. Here, deep in the forest, with everything frozen and quiet, the only light and sound comes from my fire. It's the whole world to me right now. It dances and sings in a raspy, crackling voice to me, and I am happy to enjoy its company. I can almost imagine that I can hear it whispering and babbling happily. It's so cold. I must be tired. I'm hearing things. The popping and sizzling of the fire is really beginning to sound like words. Maybe I'm just lonely out here. Maybe I just really want someone to talk to. So I'm hearing coherence in the chaos of the fire. I could have sworn I heard it say, it's so cold. There it was again. Softer this time. I lean closer to the blaze and its warmth caresses my face, setting me at ease. I'm listening intently now, anxious for what I'll hear next. If you let me die tonight, you'll die tonight. There was no mistake in it. It said it clearly, albeit in a raspy, sing-song voice of a fire consuming wet branches. 
Yet even as the words became clearer, they become softer, drawing me in closer to make out the next statement. The warmth splashes over me as I inch my face closer, and the frost that had settled in my bones begins to thaw. The fire is speaking constantly now, chattering quietly to itself, and I can pick out only bits of words and portions of sentences. Get closer. Watch closely. If I die, you die. I'm the only thing keeping you alive. Pay attention. The fire ends its tirade with a loud snap of burning wood, and then is quiet. I lean in even closer, eager to receive whatever secret is coming next. The heat is no longer pleasant. It sears me as the flames playfully lick at my face. The fire is being coy, teasing me with its silence to see how long I will wait on it. The smoke reaches into my nostrils and the embers float carelessly from the heart of the fire into my eyes, which are now welling with ash. I don't care. I just want to hear what comes next. Get closer. Pay attention. Watch closely. December 17th, 2003. In other news, the charred body of an unidentified man was found deep in the mountainous forests east of the city. Investigators have stated that the man appeared to have caught fire while sitting by his campfire and, inexplicably, did not appear to have made any effort to extinguish himself. His burned remains were found, frozen in position by the icy temperatures leaning over the ashes of a long extinguished fire. In what is perhaps the most bizarre detail of the grisly scene, the man is reported to have been found with an expectant smile still on his face. Well, I hope you enjoyed this evening around the campfire. It really was nice having some guests to tell stories with me. Now you remember, go check out their channels. Absolute masters of the horror narration community, each and every one of them. Well, that's enough for this evening. I think we've run out of hot chocolate finally. Oh, definitely time to go home, everyone. But like I said, thanks for joining me. And if you enjoyed this, maybe a few of us will get together again real soon and do it again. But for now... Bye-bye.